Is it? Uh, great. Well, I'm so glad that you made it down to the very, very end of the hall and are joining me today to talk about something I love so much, writing content for usability. And really what today is going to be about is this, utilizing content to orient users and encourage engagement. Haha, <laughs> just kidding. Nobody talks like that. <laughs> Especially not me, that's for sure. This is really a talk about choosing words that make your site easier to use. This is super important for lots of reasons that I'm going to get into today, including words like this, connect. We see everywhere. Can somebody tell me what connect means? In the way that we use connect often online. <laughs> connect with us. Give us your email address. Give us your email address. Why not say give us your email address? What about resources? Oh, links. <laughs> <laughs> list of links. List of links. Things that don't fit in our IA. Things that don't go on other pages. A dump of all the things that are probably valuable to you in the context that they're most valuable, but we're just gonna put them on this page instead. Please, please. <laughs> Synergies. <laughs> For this talk, which in the program says I'm gonna be talking about four compelling four four characteristics of compelling content, I've actually changed things. I'm gonna be talking about two things. But for this talk, I went through and I found, I went through in enough university and college and library sites to, well, I went through a lot. And I saw the word synergies on several, like departmental home pages, you know? You know, the synergies of our faculty. I'm like, who? Who? This, uh. Anyway, so no synergies, please. That also includes, you know, things like this Baldwin Walls homepage, great, your success, the two most important words in our vocabulary. Who is that written for? Who is personal engagement, culture of champions, inspired ambition, forever Duke? Who's that written for? Marketing professionals. Somebody's eating. High school students, even when it says high school students, who would talk to a high school student saying smaller class sizes so you get the attention you deserve? <laughs> talk to parents. Right, right. So this is what I'm really getting into today. All of us, we have various audiences, we have various stakeholders and part of our projects, part of our user experiences. And so really what, I'm, when I talk about content, today for the purpose of this talk, I mean words, just the words themselves. I know that there are images and there are videos and there are other things that comprise content as different assets, but today when I, whenever I refer to content, I mean words. Also, whenever I say usability, I don't mean just the labels or just the letters on the call to action. I mean the ease of use, generally speaking, right? So when we put those two things together, we really think about content as part of the user experience, as part of usability. We can really start thinking about the fact that lack of usability is felt by our users, right? So I just brought up a few examples of pieces of content that affect us. We really sit and actually read them and think about why they're there. How are they helping us? with usability. How are they helping us find our way on this site? How are they helping us make sense of this site? Are they? For example, I wanted to look up the physics graduate program at Harvard. Look, I'm wearing the same shirt even. <laughs> <laughs> so I go to, that makes sense, right? Graduate programs, thank you. Yeah, and all of these might be a little wonky because I tried to fit them on the screen. So I'm looking for physics. I'm looking for physics. Everything's organized by the program department. I don't know what that is, so I'm going to go up to the search bar. Physics. Okay, sweet. First result takes me to a 404 page. <laughs> so I'm like, sweet, I'll just go to the home page. Oh, wait. I love the look on your face. <laughs> what? OK. This is really the core of what I'm talking about today. It's hard to trust what not, what's not usable. Okay? It's harder to choose what you don't trust. So much of what we do online is try to establish trust with our users by sounding a certain way. And when we're, in fact, failing to give them exactly what they are there to find in the first place. And I get it because we're trying to balance the needs of the marketing department or alumni affairs or admissions or whatever. 
But at the end of the day, all of our users are trying to do something. We want them to do something. How can we help them to do it? They're going to do it more easily if they can trust that we're there to help them, that we really understand why they're there, what they're trying to get to. So, little story. 2003, I started working at George Mason University. I was a happy person. I barely Whoa. ate suckers. <laughs> yeah, I worked with Karen, who I haven't seen since like 2005. Hi, Karen. Uh, I ate suckers with happy faces on. Um, I worked in College Hall. I also wore very sweet shades. I worked with a team of one, aside from me. Um, and I was okay at what I did because I won awards for things. But along the way, I ran into the expected hurdles that come with working in the web in 2003 that I think still exist organizationally in 2010, 2011, 2012. Namely, that this is a distributed, these are distributed content managers. And in 2003, at George Mason University, there was no central content management system. Is there one now? No. Oh. <laughs> no content management system today. But there wasn't then either. So I was using Contribute. This is how I was starting to really create any sort. I didn't know what information architecture was. I didn't know what user experience design was. I had degrees in journalism. I knew how to write content. But I started realizing that across these 30 departments, and uh, this College of Arts and Sciences, everybody had different ways of referring to themselves, to their program, to their faculty, and this was unnecessary because it was making content very hard to manage and it was certainly making it hard when people would come to our college website to actually orient users around the departments. So there was both an organizational need and also a user experience need that I was using Contribute to structure templates that could be reused very easily and refer to the same sorts of things in the same sorts of ways. And when I deployed it out to three different sites, or three of those different departments, I will never forget the very first email I got, nothing. This was like months of work. And the very first email I got said this, only this. <laughs> what? This was really for me an educational experience. It was like 2004, and that's when I learned usability. It is not about you. It's not about your to-do list, the thing that you worked for a week on, that you got approved by your dean, that you put out on the website that helps no one. You pat yourself on the back and you walk away and your users can't get what they need. The organization as a whole can't get what it needs. I get it. It's hard because it's a distributed workforce. Usability, though, is about your users. This is what really comes down to whether or not your online presence is successful. Can your users use it? Can they find what they need? And when I talk about content as part of it, <coughs> content that's usable really comes down to two things. This is what I'm going to spend today really talking about. One, how easy is that content to find? And two, how easy is it to understand? So when we think about findability, we're thinking we're starting to bridge into information architecture and the flow. What are the sorts of things that we can use to learn about how people navigate a site? We talk about understandability. Now we're starting to really talk about the content itself. What are people reading? Are they getting what they need in order to take an action? Because rarely, rarely does somebody come to a home page, see apply, hit apply, and know exactly what to do. But that apply button is on the home page. It's on the home page, taking up space. And in fact, now I know on many of the department sites, there is no apply button. It is about the program done. At that point, that's where now I understand I'm ready to act and I can't. So in that sort of way, content isn't compelling me to do anything. It's not usable. It's disconnected. So I want you, this is my nephew Nathan, uh, I want you to think about content. This is part of your usability. This is so, so crucial to whether or not somebody can do something. I want you to think about its findability and its understandability. And I want this to be your mission. I want you to save the world Superman-ish like I am, Superwoman-ish. But let's get into some examples so that you can um, better understand what's in my brain. When I talk about findability, findability is felt by your users, okay? We all know this, right? Because how do you feel when you can't find something? Frustrated. Frustrated, yes. 
Like an idiot? Yeah. Yes. No, I think they're idiots. Oh. <laughs> no, no, how do you feel when you I can't know. find I something feel like they're You're idiots. jumping ahead, Betsy. You're jumping ahead. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I feel like an idiot. Why can I not find this? Start doubting ourselves. Like we're doing something wrong as users. Except Betsy. Betsy gets it. <laughs> they're doing something. Well, anyway. It feels frustrating, right? So if I'm looking for, again, for the physics program now at the University of Texas site, Austin, I'm going to go up to academics. Every, you know, universities, they sort of have the same sort of lingo, you know, sort of where you should go. Now I'm looking for a major. I'm looking for physics. Oh, okay. There's this thing over here. Find your major. Blamp! <laughs> So I think I'm in the wrong spot now, because there's a kit. I'm like, wait, when I grow, okay, I'm going back. Let me, maybe I'm in the wrong spot. Let me hit, nope, academics, I am on the right page. All right, let me keep looking, let me keep looking. Academic links, little tertiary navigation in the bottom. By the way, sorry, this, I think this, this site's built different here, and so it's gonna get over to the side. Anyway, now it's again, organized by department. So I don't know what department's in, so I literally am using Apple F to find physics. And then I end up on the UT Physics. <laughs> I just look back and everybody's mouths were open. <laughs> okay. Exactly. Now, this, you see the findability was really tough on this one. Once I actually get in here, this whole site is made for the student who might be here. It breaks down the physics program. It describes the different classes in a way that students would actually be interested in them. It includes all the things about physics that might be actually interesting to me. By the way, I meant to, kick, to click stop, and I was still just navigating the site right now. Because I had never been across something that so effectively spoke to a prospective high school student in using a sort of language that this UT physics site did. Design aside, navigability, obviously getting here was really tough. I found it using search versus actually being able to understand the flow. The so findability was really lacking. But I use this as an example because you see that there is somebody who's thought about in the resources that they have, how can we do a better job of communicating to a student who might be on the site what to expect. We've literally broken it down by the years that you would be in the program. This is awesome. This is awesome. It's rare. But we trust things that don't make us think about where to look first. So again, talking about the findability. What are the things that help us find things that we go to time and time again when we're looking for information? We know we need to go find a trusted resource. We go to Google. Google makes finding things really easy. So does Amazon when we're looking to find a product or price something out or get comments on something. Or Wikipedia, which is all user-generated content anyway, but makes finding things very easy. How can we structure our sites so that the content that we've got that's most sought after by our users is more easily found. That's really the question that we need to answer. And we can always make content more findable than it is right now. Because we have data. <laughs> data, they are our friend. This is probably gonna not be a good contrast, but if you just look at the top content, I mean, how many of you have Google Analytics on your site? Okay. How many of you look at Google Analytics regularly? Good. And then finally, how many of you have used Google Analytics to diffuse conversations with people who are trying to tell you how to do something and you don't? Yeah, <laughs> I can't even finish this sentence. Yeah, you all, right? Because this is data. Now, this data, of course, is tainted. It's not the word I want to use, but it's the word I just used by the user experience that exists on the site already. So it's not necessarily optimized in exactly the way that we could have you know, pristine data on something and know where to refine something. A lot of us are making a jump from something that's real crap to something that's gonna be great. And the data here can help tell us which pages are people going to the most. And that top content, the top content in Google Analytics is what you need to get up on your navigation, in your flow, up, up high so that you can actually learn about conversions. Because conversions you definitely can't learn from Google Analytics if nobody can find. If people can't understand when they get there, they're not going to convert. Your conversion numbers are going to be much different. 
So start by making sure that you're giving people content, testing against that, making sure that that content is really the thing that's available to them. And then you can start backing into looking at that conversion data, because this will actually be more accurate. Does that make sense? Thank you. All right. So users, of course, are our data. They're the people who are making those little numbers on Google Analytics happen. Who are our users? That's our starting point. Well, they might be this really nice, happy student with a laptop, but probably they're more like this. <laughs> or this. Or this. And maybe some of them are like this. <laughs> and of course we've got parents. We've got some real real parents. <laughs> but they might be having some issues about how are we gonna pay for college. Maybe they're these parents. <laughs> Maybe this is where they are right now. Alumni. Remember where you were right when you graduated? <laughs> Remember what you were trying to do with your career so that you could get enough money so you could give it back to your college? <laughs> Users are people who want to find something. Often, when we are working on constructing a website, we forget that they're the people who are sitting on that couch looking at that stack of bills. We maybe know that they're there, but we forget what that feels like. We don't stop to think, what is this person feeling? When they come to this site, they're feeling that thing. They're probably feeling frustrated if they can't find your, your content. But if they actually find your content, what are they feeling? What, are they, what, what do we need to provide to them to make them feel less like whatever they're feeling? They want to find something. What do they want to find? This is what they want. They don't want to find your welcome message. Welcome to the Office of Alumni Affairs. The Office of Alumni Affairs hosts programs and events every year for alumni. Like, duh. <laughs> here that's not just about you, that's about me and what I need. How can I find the information that you have that I want? I want the answers. I want the answers to questions like this. Do you have my degree? Emory does a great job with this. They're academics. I see degrees and programs. It's a second thing down there. I can then filter by undergraduate. I can then scroll, even though they're organized by department, it's all still alphabetized in a way that I can easily find physics. But then you'll see that now, I found physics, but now I'm on the physics department site. Now where do I find out about the physics undergraduate program? Well, it's a completely different navigation. Something for everyone. See program details. Okay, yeah, what's the deep? What is this? Oh, it's this. What does this mean? To a student, right? Like, so findability is the first part. Of course, it, in the ideal world, it works in conjunction so that the main university site or the main entrance point for me leads into the most understandable point at which I can get the answers to my questions and then be able to convert. But often, because there are two different groups, or many different groups working on these things, they're not working in tandem, but somebody's in the lead. Again, going back to the content on Google Analytics and asking for that content, having access to that content, you can find out which content people are going to and their flows to get there. My guess is that most people are going to the physics department homepage right at the get-go. What does that mean? What what additional liberties can you take? Because you know you don't have to set it up the same way that the main university has to set up the experience. How do I apply? This might be another question that people ask, right? How do I actually apply? What do I do here? Maybe not quite so much like Strayer's done here. Getting started in a You have many choices. We'll help you make the right ones. 
We'll help you get started. We'll help you find a way to pay. But like none of it is actually answering my question. All content. It's just all filler. It's supposed to be reassuring, and I get it. Because like I've written that sort of content, a reassuring bear hug content that like you've already made the choice. But this is just taking up space and standing in my way now, not actually giving me answers. It's not actually giving me answers. What questions? <laughs> yeah, maybe giving me more questions. Which classes should you take? Yeah, I need to establish trust that you know that you know me, and that I that you know what answers I'm asked that I need answered, or what questions I need answered, and you're just answering them. Then I'm able to find things very quickly. I'm able to understand it. I'm able to make decisions more effectively. Can I afford this? Well, again, something like setting up costs and aid, tuition and other costs, tuition and fees, financial aid, scholarships and grants. Where do I find? Where do I find if I can afford this? I have to navigate the way that you've constructed the page here and then put pieces together. There's nothing here that really breaks it down in a way that answers that question. I have to do so much work just to find the content. And then when I do find content, it doesn't actually give me answers. It says things like, we're committed to helping students meet the cost of a St. Mary's education. Well, I would hope so. <laughs> <laughs> don't tell me that. Tell me what the cost of a St. Mary's education is. Anybody from St. Mary's? By the way, I don't mean like, for because I'm sure that there are going to be examples in here of places whom you know or you work at, and I'm sorry, but <laughs> it's no offense. All right. Thank you, Karen. Karen's like, it's fine. Don't worry. Keep going. OK. Will you care about me? If I'm going to invest in this, if I'm going to make this decision, I'm going to show up there. My parents are going to help me pay for it. I'm going to be getting the state to help me pay for it. And I am showing up there every single day. And then I leave. What's that mean? Something, again, like this. It doesn't quite work to, like this is, these are, these are the graduates. I get it. This is so standard, right? You get it. This is like your site. You know? <coughs> welcome, maybe I said, welcome to the Northeastern Illinois University Alumni Association. And then it says the exact same thing again. Through its programs, projects, membership, builds, and fosters relationships. With, yeah. Membership information page. Isn't that what I'm on? Why are you giving me a link? <laughs> alumni activities. Alumni data requests. I don't know what that means. Publications. Send an update. What? What kind of update? Like, but this is the language because we have constraints on the navigation because we are working with various technologies and various people that we're not actually remembering that there's a user on the other side who's like, well, sure, I'd go back to Ohio University, but like, I don't know why I would go back or if there are events for me. Or, there are real people who have real things and they're not sure what to do. And then we are just coming up with labels that fit in that navigation that don't help them do anything. Well, it's content. It doesn't help them do anything. It's not usable. And finally, when do they act? So assuming that they find content, after they get the answers, only then can they act. It's not just about finding. That's why there are these two pieces to it. You've got to find it, and then you have to understand it. <coughs> so really the core of this first step, build user experiences around sought after content rather than organizational constraints. I am assuming you've heard this message in almost every talk. Yes? Yes. Yeah. I get it. Like, it's tough to do. But again, like I said in the beginning, usability is not about you. Usability is about your users. They're telling you already. You've got it. You've got Google Analytics. You've got the data that shows you what content they want. Findability helps users get to answers without them needing to know your path. They don't have to know how your college is structured. They don't have to know anything. They just have to come to the site with an intent to find an answer, and you have to be there with the answer. And you know because you've got the data to support what, an what answers they're coming to find, what content they're coming to find. Understandability is the second half of this. How many of you write content the end users see. Wow, okay, so like most of you. Cool. So how, can someone please volunteer and tell me how you go about writing content? Like what's your process for writing content for these public facing pages? 
Rebecca, come on, I saw you were like, oh, okay. Yeah. Um, I usually start by listing out the primary questions and the primary tasks and then prioritizing them. Like China. Did you hear? Can you try again? Okay. <laughs> um, I usually start by listing out the primary tasks and the primary questions okay. that users might have for that particular page and then try to prioritize them. Okay, so starting with thinking about the user's questions and what they're trying to achieve, prioritizing them. When you start writing, so you write the content, what hurdles do you run into along the way? Jargon sometimes. Okay. Um, trying to explain it for multiple audiences. That multiple audiences, that's great, ones. that's a great one. Mm -hmm. Is this felt by other people in the room? Trying to write content? Yeah. Preach. What's that? Preach. Yeah, okay. <laughs> this is, this never goes away. This never goes away. To have this process of putting yourself in your user's shoes, knowing what questions that she wants to ask. Yes, Jason? Um, one of the things that I've found helpful is just like the design process, keep the, the personas that you've created on the wall, read to them. Like, you just always have that as a point of reference through like every discussion. Like, that's, I don't do that much of the writing, but it's, I've just always found that helpful to kind of visualize it better. Yeah, yeah. Being able to always be in your user's shoes allows you to write content. Um, compelling to them. In a genuine way, right? But the most important part about that sort of a process, about really understanding what they're trying to achieve, is because it actually helps them make decisions better. Okay, I'm not saying they make better decisions. I am saying it <coughs> helps them make decisions better. That might mean more quickly, more easily, more confidently. Maybe means a lot of those things for that person. But the thing is, it's not frustrating. Like they understand it, they don't read it and feel all the same things that they feel when they can't find it in the first place. They don't feel frustrated, they don't feel like idiots. They feel like you have been able to properly capture in words the things that they need to read in order to be able to make a decision. Again, how do you feel when you can't understand something? Imagine, and like you saw a couple different sites already, Imagine if you go looking for something specific like physics and you navigate that site and A, you can't find it, and then B, when you get there, you can't understand what it freaking says. What does this mean? How do I apply? I still have all these questions. At least I know they have it. Maybe I'll just call someone. And then I bet the staff on the call center side is like so thrilled. <laughs> go to the website. <laughs> I came from the website. You think I'm going to be on the phone? <laughs> Makes people very unhappy. Obviously, I'm not a designer. <laughs> All right. Anyway. Choose words that you'd expect your user to say out loud. So as part of that process that you were just describing, Rebecca, one of the things that always hampers me as a writer is when I start letting that secondary persona, that, that third audience type, start coming in to my brain as I'm writing the content, feel like I've got my groove, I'm really communicating the message, and then my dean is going to say, oh, that sounds like it's too dumbed down, right? But again, remember the pictures of the high school kids, like this is who we're talking to. They're not dumb, but they don't know what the word synergies mean. All right, this is the sort of thing where balance is key. So starting with that primary audience, who is most likely to be on this page? This page is not necessarily going to be for every audience type. And maybe you have different sites. Like I am dreaming of the day that there is a college website or a major organizational website that has these very distinct audiences that has a different website, share some of the same content, but has a different website for each of the audience types. It's like what my mom and dad cared about when I was 18 <coughs> is very different than what I cared about when I was 18. And this is the sort of user experience that makes me go to them and say, oh, God, I got to go here, I got to go here, I got to go here. And then the parents can come here and say, like, oh, this does seem very nice. But nobody's having an ambiguous, really, uh, uh, ambiguous user experience in the meantime. That's a total aside, by the way. <laughs> Choose words that you'd expect your user to say out loud. Because what's really important as part of this is how do users understand? We need to understand how they understand. So did everybody go to Whitney's talk yesterday? Mm -hmm. Oh man, I almost took a picture, put her slide in my slide of, that's very meta, isn't it? Um, <laughs> of the like 10 questions that you need to ask to really understand how somebody's thinking about um, a, a particular 
question that they need an answer to, right? So not judging them when they say like, well, I don't know how to pay for it. And you're like, but there's a financial aid tab. You know, like, <laughs> <laughs> you're setting the expectation for what they can expect to get from you, right? So like, don't be mad at them if they feel like they can't get it, right? And so understanding how they understand how users understand is really important as you start to write content. Because when they come to your site, they're scanning first and reading second. This is how you navigate sites too, when you're looking for something. Because generally speaking, most people don't go to a university site just because, oh, I wonder what they're up to. <laughs> they're looking for something. They're looking for something in particular. So they're gonna scan the page, looking for that thing, and then once they start feeling like they're honing in on it, then they're gonna start reading. So, as an option, on, or as another slide on the Baldwin Wall site, they have this, graduate in four years guaranteed. Way better language than your success, two words in our vocabulary, or whatever it said on the earlier slide. <laughs> graduate in four years guaranteed, yes! That means something to me. I want to graduate in four years, and are you guaranteeing, are you giving me money back if I don't graduate in four years? Is this going to be the best four years of my life, or what? Anyway, but it, you know, definitely is something that I'm going to scan and stop and read. Clary has an excellent uh, homepage in terms of being able to speak specific language to an otherwise, I think, general audience with things like this. Our textbooks are delivered directly to your door. This much awarded annually in total student financial assistance. These are starting to reassure me on some of the things that are just like the hot, like the questions that I have. Do you have my degree? But like, how does this all work? Like, these are starting to get real specific right on the home page. On their undergraduate page, they actually have all of their audience types broken down. I'm a high school student, transfer student. They've done what I talked about. I would say 50% well. You saw the web page of the high school students. But they've done a structure that allows me to self-identify and then follow into a flow that helps me find the answers to the questions that I'm most likely to have. So once I get there, I already am loaded up with content that's going to help me understand whether or not this is actually the right program for me because it's catered to me. At Lafayette, the university, I love this. This is their physics department um, uh, site. And it's got some general language up top. Again, the language I think is really approachable. It's very understandable. It gives me all of the things that I need, all of the things I need. And as you keep scrolling down, there's additional information on research opportunities and facilities, things that I can get involved in, the program itself. <coughs> All of this stuff is the kind of content that helps me understand <coughs> physics knows, like the physics department knows me, knows what I'm after. It's giving me the content to help me make a decision. Pomona College does this great thing on its homepage, being able to see parts of the user, or sorry, parts of the college experience. They've taken, you know, move-in day, and they've made move-in day the whole thing. This is what you can expect from move-in day. Notice grand gallery with all this content that really, I think as if I was considering Pomona, I would come here and be like, this is cool. Look at how much time they're devoting to just the student experience of moving in. And there are parents all over these pictures, like the parent experience of moving in. Like I understand this, like Pomona gets it from a student perspective. Also that dog's pretty cute. <laughs> so that question again that they come here, do you have my degree? What can you tell me that helps me understand whether or not you really have the degree that I want? Well, first of all, Oakwood makes finding it really easy, right? So they've got all of their academics and then tabs, undergraduate, graduate, like you can't miss it. They have completely eliminated all of their structure otherwise. So I know I can jump in here and find the degree I'm looking for. Duke's done something similar here on their admission site. Majors, minor certificates, they've just removed the whole college structure otherwise. Then once I actually get into a university page, like this is Loyola Marymount's, then I'm now greeted with an awesome, awesome physics and engineering, physics, which I didn't know was a thing, page, where basically all the things that I need, including like apply now, visit required, by the way, of course, across departments, it's the same sort of user experience, that I need in order to read, make decisions, and then take an action. This is what I need. 
to understand about the physics degree and what I'm supposed to be doing once I feel like it's met my expectations. So down the page, they, they go into detail at length. Is this major right for you, our faculty? All the different types of courses that you can expect to take, but not broken down in the way I showed you earlier, where it's like the, you know, the hours that you're going to be expected to, to fulfill with them and that sort of thing. Um, but in a more general way that helps me feel like I understand the lay of the land. Ohio State's physics program, finding it isn't too bad. Sorry, I don't know why this is a little too wide. But they've gone with the alphabet approach, right? Find physics, you know what you're looking for. Now I'm into physics page. This usability totally stinks, right? PDF. But holy cow, this content is everything I need. It even includes what I could be expected to be paid coming out of college. I am not advocating PDFs from the navigation. Please, please know that. But this is where, I know when I was at George Mason, like we had these awesome one-pagers, two-pagers, whatever. We spent so much time on these things. We printed them, we put them everywhere, and then they would end up on the website in PDF form, just like that. But that's just lazy. That's just lazy. The content is great. But you can take it. You've got the content already. Move it in a findable way, in a really findable way. How do I apply? They have that question when they come to the site. Okay, how do I apply? Well, something like this works pretty well. Our Virginia Community College, one, two, three, four. All the information you need up top, you get into it as you're going along. It has a big save button. First year applicants at Furman. I love this language. Some students fill out lots of applications. Some fill out one. As far as we're concerned, this is the most important application you're going to complete. And then all the information that you need. This is broken down, plain text, very easy to understand for a student who's going to be filling this out. All the required steps and then optional steps. Like, you, if you can't do this, you probably shouldn't be going to firm. <laughs> <laughs> They've made it so easy. They're not making you jump through hoops. They want you to be able to do it. The language reads as such. I know I'm like, I'm in love with Lafayette, but the site does a great job, again, from a content perspective, even about the application process. They have all these like, admissions calendar on the side, how to apply, planning your visit, like all the things that you would need to know about applying, about showing up on campus, about getting orientation, all that sort of stuff. So something like launch your life, well, I could do it without. Financial considerations, and then even profiles of people who've gone there, who've applied there, what they've gotten out of it. So that takes that Furman example a big step further. They've given you all the things that you need to complete it, plus some additional information to help make you, sh to help, to help make sure that you understand what you're getting into by applying. Can I afford this? Is this something that I can actually do? On the Duke site, this bar won't move when I take screenshots. Sorry, Kelly Kenny. Kelly Kenny, maybe you should do something about this. Um, the, the estimated cost of attendance, hey, you got 59 grand, you could probably go to Duke. They just break it down. Okay, everybody's like, oh, I don't want to. <laughs> I didn't say you have to. <laughs> okay. And then, uh, you know, they've got a little bit about in their admissions policy. They've got additional information about uh, financial aid programs and that sort of thing. But they take this, you know, they don't have like an entire list. They take this and they break it down. So you at least know, if you look at that number and you suffer a heart attack, you're probably not going to college anyway, but if you suffer a heart attack, like this is not the place for you if you can't afford it. Okay, done. It made me jump through a bunch of hoops. It just gave me the answer. Flagler, I think, does a great job here. They take it into a little bit more detail. So, you know, there's the general marketing content up top. And then a quick way to ask an admissions director some um, additional information about the actual fees that you can be expected to pay, plus content that supports why you would have to pay those fees rather than just having it be a line item, which I really like. This is, this, this is I think, the most of, of any of the ones that I saw um, like just, what's the, what's the saying? Open the kimono. Open the kimono. Thank you. Somebody. Yes. All right. Yeah. 
This is pretty much everything. I sat there with a calculator. Oh wait, they give me a net price calculator. I guess I don't have to, check that out. So you're basically seeing the entire you're seeing the entire expectation of what you can pay broken down. This answers my question, can I afford this, right? And you saw that there are different ways to go ahead and address that. Then finally, will you care about me? Is this something that I actually, like if I go, go here, is this something that is gonna, am I gonna feel valued or am I just gonna feel like another number? There's that word connect. But one of the things that Georgetown does really nicely is it allows for this like, you know, goes on and on. If you don't, it's not saying, hey, give us your email address, give us your, it's like, hey, here are where we live out there if you want to just sort of like watch us from the outskirts and follow us on Twitter or Facebook, that sort of thing. I love University of Delaware volunteer opportunities. So they have all of the volunteer opportunities. Here are the ways that you can volunteer and exactly who to email and what to do in order to do it. So you just break it right down. Same thing with actually investing. On Central Baptist College, they take the same approach, right? Methods of giving. There are all of these ways that you can give us money and all how to do it as well. So it's not just this high level, Welcome to alumni affairs. Come to some events and that sort of thing. Because if I'm coming here looking for something specific, just give me the specific thing. In order for me to act, I have to trust you. In order for me to act, I have to understand what it is that you're about. That you're able to address my concern. You're able to answer my questions. You have what I need. I'm going to feel it. And you can do this. You can do this. You can start now, after my talk by asking yourself, what kind of person will be reading this and what questions does she need answered? Just starting there, I mean, I can't imagine in admissions all the questions that you get in admissions office, right? But could those actually be boiled down to, do, do three to five questions, or do, they, do they actually comprise 75% of the inquiries that you get? You know, what are the questions that you're not answering up front enough to prevent 75% of your volume of whatever that volume means to you in your department. Then it's about prioritizing those sought after content to be so obvious it's without a doubt findable. That's why I said like I have this dream that someday I'll just come to a college site and it'll say are you a student, prospective student, parent, whatever. And then like it's just like there are three main questions. It's like which one of these is your questions? Because like that's the sort of thing that I want to know you understand. I'm coming here looking for something specific. You've thought about the question I have and you've got the answer. And then writing substantive content that answers a question so she can understand. And the trick I use on a regular basis with this is it's so, so hard to break old habits of using jargon, of making very beautiful sentences. Um, plain can be beautiful too, by the way. I didn't mean to suggest that it was ugly. Uh, I always read it out loud. So whatever I've written for a, a client or even um, an email and that sort of thing, I'll read it out loud and I'll pretend that that audience is standing right across from me. If, it, if at any point I feel like I just said something out loud, I would never actually say out loud. It would only be something I wrote because I thought about using the word innovative, you know, <laughs> or whatever. You see the word innovative everywhere. It's not that innovative. So if I end up having this conversation out loud and I feel sheepish at any moment, like I probably would not say that word, then that's not the right word. There's probably a word that's more basic that could be used to communicate in a more genuine way. So I know, I have been there. I spent three and a half years at George Mason, two years at Ohio University before that. I know, we have many departments. It's really hard sometimes, a lot of times, most of the time, to actually write content that somebody's going to approve or that we really understand the subject matter to the best of our abilities because we're you know, managing content over here, but we've got 900 things to do over here and we've got to help plan this event and whatever. But again, data. Go back to like, Google Analytics top content is your thing. It is your thing. It is your answer. It is your diffuser. I know you have tech constraints too, right? And taking little pieces of that seeing how much you can push it here and there. This is something that you can do, certainly we saw it with the UT site, for example. Data again, the data is the way, data are the way that you're able to actually make decisions 
that fly sometimes in the face of tech constraints. And I know that, for example, like George Mason now is using a ton of WordPress sites because they couldn't decide on a content management system. And so in, in, instead of just sitting and waiting for decisions to be made and going through that entire process, they kept having to do stuff. They kept having users. They kept having questions. They started answering the questions using these little WordPress sites that were just going to be band-aids. And now they're just like all WordPress sites. So using the data, we need this, sometimes can help create a conversation around what tech has to happen today. Has to happen today. The data support it. <coughs> and small budgets. WordPress is free. Email. Like, how much can you actually go out and actually be communicating with people outside of your site if your site really just needs an overhaul and can't be saved or something? What are the other tools that you can use to start communicating your <coughs> message, answering questions in an understandable way? Again, data will tell you what you should be talking about outside of your site or outside of whatever budget constraint you have that you can use that time and that energy that you've got talking about the kind of content people are coming to your site to find in the first place. I promise you can do it because you guys are awesome. Thank you for coming. What questions do you have? And uh, Using Google Analytics for top content to help you know, bolster your defense of things. Um, I feel like I have people who, they always want all their stuff on the front page. They don't want it three clicks away, even if the three clicks make a lot of sense. So I feel like they would argue, it's not top content in GA because it's three clicks away. Like, I don't think I can use it to actually bolster my defense of the organization of the website. You know? So, okay, so you should just quit your job. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, just kidding. Um, so, yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's why it's sort of caveated with it's going to be tainted, you know, because it's not exactly the user experience that is optimized for whatever content. That said, you basically, every every home page for the most part is a stamp collection. It's typically what I call it, right? So, like, they're every single group who has some sort of stake and they get moved around and only one commencement is in the feature area and then it's, you know, homecomings in the feature area or whatever and everybody else sort of gets the shaft. But like, I really think when it comes down to um, having a conversation around analytics, you have to be so knowledgeable about the, the flow, the flow of how people are getting there in, um, I can't think of the word, it's um, in um, context, in context. So if there are like a million people coming to your homepage, right, how many of those million people make it into that section, inside that section? Just Look at the section, all the top content that's in that section. Because that's going to be representative of the experience that they have inside that vertical, right? When they get in that vertical and they see the sub-navigation, which almost always exists, right? They're always going to the same sorts of pages in that vertical. There's a reason why they got into the first click and a reason they got into the second click. And in most of these sites, I can honestly say now, it's either because they've self-identified as a type of audience or they've self-identified as needing a type of content. So they're either going to admissions and aid or they're going to prospective students. So that's automatically off the table. That's your first click, off the table. They're self-identifying either as content or audience. Now what? So it's like secondary down, wherever they find themselves in that vertical, thank you, whatever they find themselves in that vertical, that's your content. That's your top content. And so you may have to do some additional work to become so in love with the data. You know how to work Google Analytics to get out the top content in that section. But it's there. It's there. Yes? Oh, I was just going to say, I had somebody complain to me literally like just before I left the conference about that. They used to be in the homepage, and now they're not um, an internal department. And um, I actually compared the data from like a two-week period when they weren't on the homepage to like a last year when they were on the homepage, and there was no difference whatsoever. Mm -hmm. um, and then I supplemented that by saying, even our own students don't come to our website through the homepage anymore. They come in sideways. So they, if they want something, they just Google the name of the school and whatever they want, and then they click on the first search result. So I actually followed that up by saying, 
They're not coming to the home page, they're coming in sideways. And what I mean by that is they're coming in from an email blast, from Facebook, from a Google search, from whatever, yeah. and then yeah. they just shut up. Because <laughs> they, there's nothing to say in response to that, you know? Yeah. I think the path they follow is important too. That's something else you can look at. And it may not be the top page they're getting to, but it might be in one of the more popular paths that people go through. So if you can sort of prove that as well, that's kind of another data point that you can look at. Like they may not look at it here and it may be three clicks, but it's still a logical three clicks and you can prove that it's one of the most popular paths that someone followed if you decide to. And, and search, being able to see what you know, what terms people are using in Google Analytics to actually get into your site when they are coming in sideways is another way to basically say, this is the exact content they are looking for. How can we take this exact word, these terms that are bringing three quarters of our users in because they hate our navigation so much, that they can actually, you know, you can use that content to your benefit. I had a, um, I had a question about, um, you know, I, I have done the right most of the content that I put on my website. It's, it's usually come from the, uh, the department. Okay. The and, um, and sometimes I, I can tell that it's not usable. Technology, which their audience is probably not familiar with. So, how do I um, train them to start thinking like this? Like, it, yeah. are there any books or articles? No, you have to quit your job too. <laughs> <laughs> um, letting go of the words. Yeah. Great book. It's a great book. Pitch the book. So Jenny Reddish is one of the leading experts on kind of content usability and how to do more with less content, um, and she's. She's uh, done a lot of work with the federal government, actually trying to improve government websites and people like that. Um, but she's got a great book called Letting Go of the Words. It's, it's uh, kind of a step she through how to yeah. get all kinds of different types of content. It's not all just marketing content. It's right up how to kind of improve all the same sort of information. It's, it is perfect. It is a book that any, you know, large enterprise level type scale content based website, uh, everybody should read be great for you. Um, I, I like this data are our friend. Um, and I'm wondering, how do we make data be other people's friends in our organizations? <laughs> like, how do we introduce them? And has anyone had any success, success with making kind of more public, more transparent um, data within the organization? Uh, keep, having, keep having this idea of like everyone in the organization could just see on our intranet like some really important data points. Like yeah, just a, a few you're doing that. Are, yeah, we've actually we have a an assessment um, initiative, and we've decided that part one part of that has to be your website analytics. So we were requiring. I work at the division level. We're requiring every department to report out three key pieces of their Google Analytics. And frankly, the three key pieces are arbitrary. I made them up one day. But, <laughs> but it forces every single department to go into Google Analytics and look at it and report it back up to the division level. And if they don't, then our assessment coordinator comes after them. And this is, this is the first month we're doing it. And my number one thing, like we're not trying to shame them about what their analytics are or aren't. My big thing is, is it installed correctly, which is my job? You know, do you have access, which is sort of a communications issue, and can you understand it? And I will sit down with you personally until that works, and then we can move on. That's awesome. I'd follow that up and say that you need to get your analytics out of silos as well. We have been running separate profiles for all of our separate sites, and it lost the source. We could not see when somebody was going from one site to the next, even though we were cross-publishing content, making links across those sites. So um, I've actually been running two code segments in tandem for the last few months, and being able to see the traffic across the entire server and then use segments to divide it up has told a completely different story than having a segment with those different profiles. Yeah, I've, um, I do work, I've, I've run an analytics and numbers and stuff to I'm, I made it a part of faculty meetings at the department. My department head was, and still is an 
individual of a woman, but just said this is in, the website's important for our department. This is stuff that faculty need to know, and it became a part of the monthly faculty meetings where they were all corralled into one room for an hour and a half. But the analytics of what the website was doing, and especially to get them to update their faculty pages, when confronted with numbers, uh, and then they got really competitive with each other about it because they knew their number was more or less, so they either wanted to protect their number or get their number better and gamified it weirdly. So, <laughs> but we made it a part of faculty meetings, and that helped the faculty know that the web was the web was serious business because the department head was saying we're taking time out of this very precious hour and a half where we have a ton to do and talking about the web and talking about numbers. So seeing it come from the department head as well. Was huge. I'd like to have that in your tenure review. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I would love it if they had it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, I'll be hanging out if anybody has any other questions, but sounds like there's also a lot of people in this room who can talk to each other about all the different things you guys are doing on a day-to-day -day basis, so I hope you all hang out and keep chatting. Yeah? I just want to remind people to use the speaker rate, rate speakers. Um, if you didn't notice, when you, evaluate, when you go to the website with the speakers, there's a link to rate them right from their profile. Yeah, and this is a new talk, so I'd love your personal feedback as well. Thanks for coming. Thank you.